Hi, I'm Joe Diaguardi, the founder of Truth in Government. Truth in Government is committed to telling you the truth about government spending. And the way that has to be done is to bring principles that have been promulgated in the accounting profession by professionals over the years to government. It's not being done today. And as a result, Congress especially is getting away without the standards that we need to tell you the truth about real government spending. So Truth in Government wants to bring accountability, fiscal responsibility, transparency, the rules that the Security and Exchange Commission imposes on publicly traded companies to the U.S. government. And that will stop the Congress from lying to you about what is really going on with the federal deficits and the national debt. You know, the current financial crisis required a bailout. Many people didn't like it, uh, depending upon how they saw their political philosophy. Some felt it was too much intervention by government and the private sector. But it's obvious that we needed to do something because here we had the head of the Federal Reserve System, Mr. Bernanke himself, saying that based on what he saw, that we may have been three days away from the collapse of the entire economy here in the United States. And obviously, if this economy collapses, it becomes a worldwide issue. So let me go back for a minute on the history of these bailouts and, and why we needed them. Because I may see something here that we haven't seen, but before I do that, let's go back to the major one in 75. Because there's a thread here. Every one of these bailouts involved poor accounting and poor oversight or the lack thereof. When we went back to 1975, and I had experience with that one, it was a terrible set of books. Nobody could piece together the financial condition of New York City. And no one knew that they had these tax, tax anticipation notes. Some were called BAMs, some were called RANs, some were called TANs. They had all kinds of acronyms for things that show that they had the ability to collect taxes on buildings, but the buildings, when the auditors came in, we found out, were abandoned. They would never collect these taxes. So here you had a terrible set of books. My old firm, Arthur Anderson, had to bring in some of the best people to put together a financial statement for New York City. And we took New York City off the Mickey Mouse cash basis they were on, and unfortunately, the United States government is still on that system. When you go to the next bailout, the savings and loan uh, situation, why did that happen? Well, we had some very greedy people that were mortgaging commercial properties. Don't forget, these were in houses, commercial properties. And they convinced the Congress, in order to cover up the extent to which they were doing it, to pass something called regulated accounting principles for these savings, savings and loan organizations so they can almost pick their own values for the assets. That was a formula for disaster, and it just continued the problem to the point where it couldn't be solved, and we had to have a massive government intervention that cost the taxpayers $500 billion. Now we come to today, and there are many other things I could have talked about that went wrong, but keeping on the track of the major problems, we have the crisis that was created by the mortgage industry initially, the banks, but then Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, because they were created by Congress as quasi-public-private entities to make sure that people get into home ownership. Well, when you look at what happened is the accountants and the oversight didn't do their job. Accountants, not initially, because you had congressional oversight here, which looked the other way. We had the SEC chairman, and you saw him in front of the a committee, uh, the Oversight Committee, uh, in effect deregulating to the point where you couldn't see what was happening. And then you had Congress actually allowing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to write billions of dollars of mortgages without the, regula the reserves that would be required if you were a regulated bank. So here you have this crisis in, in mortgages that was created by bad accounting, or poor accounting and, and lack of oversight. Now, when I look at this, I look at the future and I see 
another gathering storm. It's not World War II, but it could be even worse from an economic point of view because I now see that the accounting system that we've stayed on, this Mickey Mouse cash basis, has disguised the real cost of government and in effect has created, in my mind, a subprime national debt. Why do I say that? Well, we now know, because it's been cited several times, that only two items, Medicare and Social Security, account for $53 trillion in unfunded and unrecorded liabilities on what should be the books of the United States of America. But since they don't have outside auditors coming in, it's hard to tell whether we have a set of books at all. So it's not the $9.3 trillion that you've heard. That's the bonded debt. That's debt that is covered by treasury bills, U.S. notes, U.S. bonds. And even there, only $5.3 trillion of that is in the hands of the public, and over a trillion, by the way, owned by China, and a little bit more owned by Japan and, and, and Germany. But you've got $4 trillion that is not in the public hands, that are IOUs that we've put into Treasury bills, the Social Security Trust Fund, the Highway Trust Fund, and these amounts have been used for other things. You cannot get away with that if you were a publicly traded corporation, but that shell game was played. But worse than that $4 trillion that has to be replaced, we have this $53 trillion and more. So where is the collateral behind the national debt of the United States? Have we put on the next generation a huge tax. Is it possible that we are not in a position right now or not in the, in the near future or in the distant future to borrow the money to cover that? So there may not ever be a bailout of the United States of America. And this could become a huge unfair tax on the next generation. That's what truth in government is all about. We're not going to solve that problem today. But let's put into place the principles, the accounting principles, the oversight, the transparency, the governance, like we did on publicly traded corporations with the law called Sarbanes-Oxley, it's time to apply those principles through the Securities and Exchange Commission on the U.S. government. The Dow has closed down another 350 points today as the federal government stepped in to rescue AIG insurance just two days after Lehman bellies up and Bank of America grabs Merrill Lynch in distress. Normal headlines? Well, how did we get here? Our next guest has some insight into the current crisis. Former Congressman Joe DiAguardia from New York became the first practicing certified public accountant elected to the U.S. Congress. He was a partner with the international accounting firm of Arthur Anderson and & Company, and since leaving Congress in 1989, Joe has established the nonpartisan foundation, Truth in Government, which advocates federal fiscal reforms. He is also the author of Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Welcome to Iron In, Joe. Thank you for having me, Lenny. Joe, today you had a letter to the editor published in the New York Times about the real cost of government. Can we begin here? Sure. First one, actually, I've tried many times to get a letter in, but it looks like they're finally getting interesting in accounting issues now that things are starting to uh, uh, collapse. And the, uh, the reason for that is that I wanted to take this opportunity to tell the public, as I have through the book and the Foundation Truth in Government, that there's a double standard. Washington does not use the accounting system that it imposes on the private sector through the Securities and Exchange Commission. In other words, if you want to sell stock, you have a kind of uh, rigid professional accounting system called the accrual basis of accounting, generally accepted accounting principles. You need an audit from an accounting firm. Well, you can't do, any, you can't do anything in the markets without that. Why? They want to protect the shareholders, the people who invest in America. So I'm saying in my book, Who's protecting the taxpayers when the government is using a Mickey Mouse accounting system, which is a shell game? It's called the cash basis. And when the Times, when I wrote this response to their editorial Sunday, because they were saying in this editorial, how is it with the collapse of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the bailout of Bear Stearns 
government is saying there's no impact on the budget deficit. So I wrote a letter saying there absolutely is, but under their Mickey Mouse illegal accounting system, they don't reflect it because everything seems to be off the books when it comes to estimating the, the losses on certain things. It's not like banks have to do. So basically they called me back. They said, well, this sounds kind of outrageous that you're saying this is illegal. We need proof of this. So I gave them the site, the public law. Believe it or not, in 56, 1956, the second Hoover Commission issued its report. Eisenhower signed it. The first one was signed by Truman, requiring the federal government to go on the right accounting system and gave Congress five years. They never did it. And that's where we stand today. That's why this is an issue. Now, not many accountants run for Congress. I'm the only practicing CPA, believe it or not. And maybe we need a few more. But even if you had, I'm not sure that would change it. We need the public to understand this issue and say, hey, if it's good enough for us and you're imposing on us through the SEC, then we want you to account for our tax dollars the same way. You've heard so many stories about the Government Accountability Office, let's just say, losing a lot of money. Let's talk for a minute about government-sponsored enterprises. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are just two of 29, we understand. Yeah. Tell us about some of the others and how that, uh, how that system is really working. Well, these are called the so-called GSEs, using the Washington acronym. But basically, what they are are the special purpose entities, and we already heard that before, with the Enron debacle. When Enron went to court, because they were fraudulently showing higher earnings and a lower debt, how did that happen? Because the accountants, and in a way my old firm, Arthur Anderson, uh, didn't see the whole picture at that time and they got caught in that mess. The accountants, what they were doing, and the management, they were putting things off the books in order to make the Enron accounting look better. So therefore, it was much worse than they knew until the end and things started to collapse. That's what's happening now. You know, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac just didn't collapse overnight. They're using an accounting system which is basically geared to the cash basis, and basically these government-sponsored enterprises are off the books or off the budget. So it's only when there's a big catastrophe requiring a bailout that you start hearing about this because then they want to go and the taxpayers have to come up with the money. They did this in 1988 with the Resolution Trust Corporation when you had the SNL crisis. This is a repeat of that. In fact, it may be even more with these subprime uh, mortgages, which they have not yet fully measured. So basically what you have are entities which are off the budget, you might say off the books of the United States of America, yet they're able to float bonds. And people would say, if you ask them, ah, well, yeah, people are buying the bonds because they think the government is backing them up, but that's an implicit guarantee. And in my book on page 47, I said, wait a minute, implicit guarantee, if these things go under, you bet your bottom dollar that the government is going to have to stand behind them. And look what we found. China has billions of dollars of these Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bonds, and you could not walk away from them. So in effect, the government did bail out these entities, but they're still off the books like the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Now, what's important about that one? When a company goes under, they transfer their pension obligation to this agency, which has a good social purpose because you want to continue to give workers some of their pension. But that entity doesn't use the right accounting. And right now, if you put it on the right accounting basis, you'd find out that there is a lot of debt that we're not recording that someday we're going to pay somebody when they retire. Now, like Social Security, by the way. This problem, it is, you talk about the federal government, this also carries over into the states, and, and uh, this is also going to be a problem concerning pensions at a state level. We understand New York and, and Albany are certainly right. dealing a lot with this. Tell us, well, let's tell talk us about, about New York. Yeah, right let's here. talk about New York. We're New here. New York is, is a real problem. Look, the politics is so right now skewed up and, and, and confused and manipulated, and nothing's changed. Here's the governor trying to do the right thing. Covering to try to cover a six billion dollar shortfall in the budget, he said, "You're going to have a special section session of, of of the legislature." Brought him back August the 19th. Don't forget, this is a part-time legislature. They go out on June 30th, and to try to cut a billion six hundred million, he can only get them to cut four hundred million. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you we're going to have to borrow a lot more money. But guess what? That's done to New York State. We're now number 49 
in terms of the worst bond ratings in America, 49 out of 50 states. Now, it's not only because of the budget deficit. Guess what else we have? What Washington has with these government-sponsored enterprises, what Enron had, it's called special purpose entities. We have them, too, in New York State. They're called authorities. We have 600 authorities off the books. Many of them are small, Mickey Mouse, don't add up to anything. But you've got some big ones, Metropolit uh, the Metropolitan Transit Authority, the Power Authority. Now, many times when these politicians decide they want to find a nice place to put their friends, they give them a job, the Battery Park Apartment Authority. There's, a, there's one of the authorities. Look at some of the salaries being paid to some of these old Pataki guys. And I'm sure the Democrats did the same thing. You're talking 150, 200,000. Why do they end up with those nice big salaries there? Because they know they're only going to be there for a few years. But guess how they calculate the pensions in New York State? It's the average of your highest three years. So they build up this nice big salary base. Now they get a lifelong pension, which they never would have been entitled to before. Worse than that, look what happened in Yonkers lately. Detectives, overtime, $100,000 on top of a base salary of 120 dollars Why? Because someone is letting them work in the last three years to build up the pension. Now, that, that goes somewhere into the pension obligations of the state. Now, it's a very complicated mess. But what's wrong with picking up the accounting system that the SEC requires business to use in order for you to sell your stock or your bonds to the public? If we can protect the public, the shareholders, the investing public, we have to protect the taxpayers too. Before we have to go, you've written about the need for a capital budget in Washington. Tell us a little about that. Well, here's another interesting thing, uh, and I point that out in the book in an article I wrote recently that appeared in Gannett, and I wish more papers would pick it up. Uh, and I sent this to both campaigns, by the way. It's very important because 37 states have a capital budget. Every corporation in America that sells shares has a capital budget. Washington doesn't have one. What's a capital budget? Capital budget is to project and prepare for the expenditures for assets. For instance, if I have an aircraft carrier that's going to cost a billion dollars, that's an asset. Now, it might go down tomorrow in a war, but at least you've got to put it on the book as an asset until you lose it. What does Washington do? Out of the almost $3 trillion we're going to spend next year, this is next year's budget, $500 billion are on those kinds of things, buildings. Uh, big equipment. I'm not talking about putting bullets on the books as assets, but capital type items. And yet they go right into the budget deficit. A capital budget would say, hey, these are assets. Put them on the books as an asset, float the bonds as infrastructure bonds, and pay those bonds off over the life of those assets. And what does this do? It's good social accounting. Why? Because now you're spreading the cost of these things over several generations who's benefiting from it. But the way they do it right now, it hits only this generation, gets put into the budget deficit, and it gives, and I saw this in Congress, Lenny, it gives the people who are now in charge of these assets the idea, oh, these are already written off, maybe next year I can sell it and bring it back in as cash so it looks like I'm making money on a cash basis for my next uh, you know, budget uh, to impress my friends. Hey, this is big money when you're talking about 500 billion dollars a year. Let's put it on the books. And why is this good? We have to rebuild America. The infrastructure problems in America. Why did I write that article last year? I wrote it the day after the bridge came down in Minneapolis because I heard there could be another thousand bridges around America that are deficient. The engineers were saying this. So let's rebuild America. And what does this do? Puts people back to work when the economy is bad. Who did this? a great Democrat, FDR, and a great Republican, Eisenhower. They rebuilt the infrastructure of America, the roads, the electrical system. Let's do it, and let's not be afraid to spend. I'm a fiscal conservative, all right? And I'm telling you, let's not be afraid to spend, but don't put it in as an expense. Put it on the books as an asset, and let's then pay that bond off over the useful life. You know what some people are saying now? Oh, we gotta sell the throughway, or the, or the Triborough Bridge, or something to a private corporation. Well, let me, let me interrupt you there. Are you an advocate of privatizing everything that isn't nailed down, which seems to have been the model of this administration going Abs back to the Reagan administration no, also? Absolutely not. There are things that are so important for the public. And to become a hostage to a corporation that wants to maximize its bottom line 
when you need to get to work, and now you don't know if they're going to raise the, 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 the tolls, you know, beyond a certain amount. That's not right. No. There are certain things maybe you can privatize, but the infrastructure of America to get to work, uh, the waterways, things that are so important, uh, I can't see government giving that license up to the private sector. In, in some cases, there may be a legitimate private-public partnership. For instance, we want to build now a new tunnel under the, uh, from Brooklyn to Port Elizabeth to get the, this is Jerry Nadler, great liberal Democrat. I'm a conservative Republican. I love Jerry. We just had dinner the other night. He's smart. He knows, he's, he's had this idea from when he was an assemblyman, and now he's on the committee in Washington for transportation. They're already doing the master uh, plan for it, or they call it the, uh, the master study for the environmental and the economic benefit. And it shows this would have a great economic benefit. But it's going to cost a lot of money, maybe $15 billion to do this. There, because we're talking about getting trucks off the highway, we may want a private-public partnership to see whether those tolls or whatever these trucks are going to pay and whether that are going to be put on this, this rail train going back and forth, uh, whether or not uh, that can be used to pay off the bonds and maybe have that controlled by a quasi-public-private entity. Now, why is that important as an idea? 9-11 showed us that this side of the Hudson is a hostage. God forbid one of these bridges go down. Tappan Z, George Washington, Verrazzano, you're cutting off the flow of goods. Most of our goods don't come into Brooklyn by boat. They go to Elizabeth, New Jersey. They got to come here. We killed the port of New York years ago because there was a whole thing by Cuomo to increase the investment in the, uh, they called them the fire industries, uh, uh, insurance, uh, brokerage, uh, stocks, all the, the different kinds of things that are related to uh, financing, okay? And what they did is they did nothing for the infrastructure on the other side where the Brooklyn Port is right now in Red Hook. So we are a hostage to that. Jerry's idea is great because, number one, gets the trucks off the road. Number two, if, God forbid, there is a, uh, a, a terrorist uh, disaster on one of the bridges, at least the goods to feed this side of the uh, Hudson will come across. So it's got a good social purpose as well. Tell us where people can get the book. Good. Well, the book is not for sale. I give it out for nothing. I feel this is my moral obligation as a former congressman uh, who you know, also was a certified public accountant. It's a rare combination. Uh, but if anybody wants it, they can write to me, Joe Diaguardi, or Truth in Government, and it's easy. P.O. Box 70, Ossining, New York. You know where Sing Sing is, up the river? I live right now just above it on the river. Beautiful place on the Hudson. I, I downsize from New Rochelle. I got one of these nice condos now. My family is kind of now out, and this is good. By the way, did you hear about my daughter? She was named the fourth judge on American Idol. Now, people are calling me that I haven't spoken to in 20 years. <laughs> I never thought this show was such a big deal. But my daughter, Cara Diaguardi, a songwriter, is now the fourth judge. But there I am on the Hudson, right above Sing Sing, and it's Post Office Box 70, 70, Austin, New York, 10562. Be happy to send them a copy of the book and the article on capital budgeting. Unaccountable Congress. Unaccountable Congress. Unaccountable Congress. It doesn't add up. Notice what's on the cover, a credit card. I used a congressman's voting card, which is shaped just like a Visa card, and I said this is the most expensive credit card in the world because every time a congressman uses it in the computer terminal, we're increasing the deficit and the national debt. Joe Diagordia, thank you so much for joining us My in pleasure. the studio here in New York.